Church, will you please join me in welcoming the whole Planet Art to Big Time Burleson, Texas, y'all. This is the Open Door Experience. Boom. Well, blessing and peace on you in the mighty name of King Jesus. Guys, this is part three in a teaching series that I'm doing on the garden. And uh, the first one was called Enter the Dragon. It was on the portrayal of Judas and how that he got offended. And once he got offended, the, the, the devil threw a fastball into him and literally put it into his heart that he should betray the Lord. And he got offended at the house of Simon the leper and God Almighty, or I should say King Jesus himself, turned to Simon the leper and said, look, you leave this woman alone. She came here to honor me. She's with the right program. You didn't even give me a kiss. You didn't greet me properly. And Jesus went, oh, you want a kiss? I'll give you a kiss. And he shows up in the garden and says, I'm going to kiss you, and I'm going to watch them beat you to death, drag you through this city naked, nail you down to a board, and hold you up for everybody to see. You don't make me mad. The spirit of offense, the spirit of offense is running rampant through the United States of America right now, and it is indeed a spirit of Judas. Do not partake in that. The second one was called A Walk in the Garden, <laughs> and it was about how that Jesus took on sin in the garden. He didn't take on sin at the cross. He took sin to the cross. He took on sin in the garden. And he actually, there's only one time in all the record of all four of the Gospels that Jesus ever asked the disciples to help him. Now, mind you, Jesus had fed them. He had given them his resurrection power. He had shown them signs and miracles and wonders. He had given them amazing positions um, um, within his ministry and even wrote them up in the Bible. <laughs> And yet there's only one time that he asked them for help, and it was when he went into the garden and there was nobody there to help him. They went to sleep. And that was Jesus' chance to be offended. Look, I'm taking on sin for you. He literally said, my soul is vexed unto death. This, this feels like it's going to kill me. Please help me. I'm not good. I need your help. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that he was, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. We know that the chastisement of our peace is upon him, but it literally means this. He took on our iniquities before he was bruised. You know what it bruises? It's when you're beat up so bad you bleed on the inside. He literally took on our, trans our transgressions before he was beaten and wounded. What's that? It's when you sin. A transgression is when you sin on the outside. He took on all of our sin, and it was a painful, horrible process. The Bible says that Jesus collapsed under the weight and when the King James boys translate, but he prayed more earnestly, that's not what it means. It literally, the word earnestly, literally in the Greek means he rolled around on the ground in pain. It doesn't just mean he prayed harder. It means how he prayed was in agonizing pain. And he kept getting up and saying, please, please pray with me. But his friends were not there for him. I want to encourage you and tell you this. What we learned in the first two parts of this message is this. Be the friend of Jesus. Be somebody that he can count on. His character is so amazing and how he loves you is so amazing. Be the friend of Jesus. Today, guys, I'm teaching a message that's called Supernatural Soldier. I want you, if you would, please open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22 is where we're at. And we're going to start at verse 39. And it says, in coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when they came to the place, he said to them, now look, I want you to pray that you may not enter into temptation. The Greek word temptation literally means that you don't freak out and bell. I need you to pray because we're about to go into something really scary, and you're going to need a special supernatural grace to not bell. See, Jesus was going to need that. I'm about to show you this. And he was withdrawn from them just about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed. I know that it's King James. I know everybody thinks that it's perfect. I'm just telling you it's a translation. The word knelt down actually means collapsed. He collapsed. And he said, Father, if it is your will, 
Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my wills, not my will, but yours be done. Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, there describes the wrath of God being poured out upon all sin as a cup. Also in the book of Revelation, perhaps you've heard the term, the grapes of wrath. It literally means you will drink this cup and it's a bitter cup. And he's saying, Lord, I've never experienced this before as God and I've never experienced this before as a human being. No one has ever experienced taking upon every wicked and evil thought that Troy Brewer has ever thought and combining that with Trey Smoker and combining that with Megan and and combining that with Leanna and combining that with you and combining that with you and all of this and all this mess is going to come. It's horrifying. The word of God says that he began to see. It literally means he entered into something horrifying he had never experienced before. You know that Jesus experienced horror as a human being? Horror. Like, well, he was God. No, 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 no. He was God, but he was God who was not pretending to be a man. He was God who became a man. He did everything that he did as a human being in right relationship with the Father to walk that out for every single one of us. So then, in verse 43, an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. There's that word, more earnestly. It literally means that he watered around on the ground. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. There's a condition that medical doctors have noted throughout the centuries, and especially happens during times of war. When people are POWs, when people are being tortured, they begin to sweat blood. And what that means is you become so stressed out that the outer layer of your skin separates from the inner layer of your skin. And the the middle part between those two layers of skin fill up with blood so that you literally begin to sweat blood. Jesus went through that. Why? Because he's in intense warfare and he's actually being tortured. Then... In verse 45, and when he rose up from prayer, he had come to his disciples who found them sleeping from sorrow. And remember, this is after an angel supernaturally strengthened him. And he looks completely different now. And he says this, why do you sleep? Rise up and pray, lest you enter into temptation. There it is. I'm telling you guys, we're in a dangerous place. That's what Jesus is saying. And you need to pray that you don't freak out and bail. And I would say that to this entire generation today. You better pray. And you better be somebody that knows how to tap into the presence of God. And you better get your head out of the lap of Delilah and quit watching the media 24 hours a day. Because you're going to get offended. You're going to get offended and you're going to show up like Judas and you're going to say, well, if Trump didn't win, I ain't going to follow God. Well, if this didn't happen that way, if that thing doesn't, if this thing didn't happen that way, if this didn't happen that way, oh, you want a kiss? I'll give you a kiss. You need to pray that you don't become horrified and overwhelmed and just go, I'm out. And Jesus was trying to explain to them the severity of their situation. Now, in verse 47, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude. Guys, the Greek word here, multitude, again, is another bad translation. If you look up the word multitude, it is a Greek word that means one-tenth of a legion. It's actually the number of people. You know, how, you know what a legion is? It's 6,000. So you know what a tenth of 6,000 is? It's 600. Did you know that 600 armed guys came to get Jesus? Do you know how many men were assigned to Pontius Pilate? 600. 600 Roman guys who made the Nazis look like Boy Scouts. And they show up. These are also the same 600 guys that walked Jesus all the way to the cross with, a, with the crown of thorns on his head, bashing him on top of the head all the way there while his body was literally, his rip, his, his flesh was ripped to ribbons. 600 guys. How horrifying would that be for you to be the one person in a crowd of 600 while everybody there is making fun of you 
strip you down completely naked and make you walk down Main Street while they made fun of you and 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 made you hurt and made you hurt and say, let me tell you what the finish line is. We are going to nail your body, nail you down to a piece of wood and hold you up and have a good look at you. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ is not, it's not about stained glass. It's okay with me that there's a stained glass version of it because there's a dramatic way that you glorify it. We're, we just got through doing some dramatic things that really glorify the Lord, amen? And I like that. But the reality of it is, it's so bad. It's, it's the worst thing you've ever seen. I've never seen a crucifixion. I've seen some, some crazy things. I was in Cuba one time and saw two men fight to the death with machetes while a group of people paid money betting on who was who. And I saw that. I, I saw a man hack another man to death with a machete. And they both fought for a long time while everybody chanted and screamed and laughed. And I saw it. I was in a car trying to drive through. It was, we were going from Havana all the way to Moa, which is a 12-hour drive from one end of Cuba to the other end of Cuba. And we were doing, going down this road, and all these people were out in the middle of the road. And we had to sit there in a 1957 Chevy with a Mitsubishi engine in it. True story. Had a Mitsubishi engine in it, had a Mitsubishi uh, drive in it, had, but it was a 1957 Chevy, and we had to sit right there. And I saw the horror of what it looks like when one human being hacks up another human being with a machete. I saw it. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing like what Jesus went through. Now, this is real. And where he takes on sin, which is actually worse for Jesus than the physical part of actually attacking the sin that is in him. All that happens in the garden. So whenever it says, uh, and while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the 12, went before them, and he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Remember that? Oh, uh, hey, I remember, hey, you wanted the kiss, right? Well, let me give you a kiss. Mwah. How about them apples? See, you should have never messed with me. I told you. And while he was speaking, behold, a multitude, and he was, who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before him and drew near to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? He's like, Judas, is this betrayal really about the kiss speech? That's all it took, man? That's it? Think about that. And when those around him saw what was going on, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Lord, do you want us to fight? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Now, we know through other accounts who this was, that it was actually Peter. And we also know that the name of the servant through other accounts in the New Testament is his name was Malchus. Malchus is not just a name. Malchus is also a title. And Malchus means speaker and leader. And he is the mouthpiece for Caiaphas. So anytime in the Bible where you see the high priest is cussing Jesus, it ain't actually the high priest. It's this guy. And Peter sees him and is like, I'm going to kill you. But the problem is he's a thrower of nets and he's not a swinger of swords and he misses his head. <laughs> There's a lot of humanity in this, isn't there? A whole lot of humanity. Now, Jesus says to them <laughs> in the midst of all this, Jesus answered and said, permit even this. He's like, um, excuse me, please. King James, boys translate it, permit even this. He's like, um, excuse me, uh, may I put your ear back on? Is that okay, buddy? There you go, that looks a lot better. Thank you. And he touched his ear and he healed him. And Jesus said to the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders who had come to him, have you come out? Like you're coming against a robber with swords and with clubs. When I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't, even, you didn't try and seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. There's so much stuff in this. And the thing that I want to encourage you to do is on your own time, go back and read this and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a supernatural lens. Not to just see it as black ink on the white page. And not also too, to just see it as Holy Scripture. 
but to actually see what it is saying. Because what it's saying to us has to do with how we live our lives today and what's real. The thing that I want to focus on is in the midst of the garden, while he was indeed struggling, agonizing, while he was indeed collapsing under the weight of your sin and my sin and taking it on in a way that he had never experienced before. He was sinless. And not because he was God. He was sinless because he chose to be selfless above all other things. Proverbs chapter 6, and I said this in the first message, it describes seven things that God hates, and all seven of them are, are a perfect description of Judas. And one of them is hands that shed innocent blood. And the last recorded words of Judas is, I have sinned in that I have shed the innocent blood. Out of his own mouth, he testifies. What is it that God hated about Judas? He was selfish. The opposite of love is not hate. That's why God Almighty hates lots of things. The opposite of love is selfishness. You should have a holy and a passionate hatred for poverty. You should have a holy and a passionate hatred for injustice. You should have a holy and a passionate hatred for slavery. I could go on and on and on and on and on about it, but I'm just telling you this. Here's something else, too, that you should hate. You should hate selfishness. You should hate your own tendencies to be so selfish, as I do, and say, Lord, you know what? Here's what's real. I have to bishop my soul with your spirit. And God, I'm a mess. Please help me. And he's like, oh, Troy, I know you're a mess, and I love you so much. But Lord God, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to fail. He'll say, oh, you will, but your faith is strong. Like, well, stop. That doesn't make any sense. That's exactly what Jesus said to Peter. Peter, the devil wants to sift you like wheat. Dude, he wants to tear you to pieces. But I've prayed for you. Now your faith is strong. And when you return to me, what? Stop. You just told him his faith was strong. Now you're telling him he's going to bail. Oh, no, he is. He's going to fail bad. But, he's got, but the brother's got strong faith. Yeah, see... Your faith is not determined by how skillfully you handle every situation in life. See, this is the way Jesus sees your faith. Because what's real is you can fail and still bear good fruit. Aren't you glad that God hadn't called you to be successful in all things? He's called you to be fruitful in all things. And as a matter of fact, not only does he tell Peter, you're going to deny me three times. I'm telling you tonight. Before the sun comes up, before, before the rooster crows, before that happens, you're going to say three different times, you've never heard of me. But don't worry. Your faith is strong. And when you return to me, make everybody else. Help your brothers because I'm worried about them. What? He's telling Peter, I'm not worried about you. Now, you're going to bell. You're going to deny me tonight, but I'm not worried about you. But when you come back, you really need to strengthen the rest of these guys. I want you to think about how non-religious that is. I want you to think about how rarely that Jesus is portrayed and demonstrated. Hey, listen, I know you're going to mess up. I'm ready for that. But I'm also ready for as soon as you get your act together, come back and help me make the rest of these people strong. Like, wow. Wow. Well, the thing I want to focus on in this, and I just have just, just a few minutes left, is this. In Luke chapter 22, verse 43, in the midst of Jesus praying and going back to his friends saying, please, I, I need your help. I'm not good. Please, please stick with me. Actually, finally, there appeared an angel unto him from heaven and strengthened him. As the word strengthening here is the Greek word, which actually means to impart strength or to empower someone supernaturally. Now, we know that right after he gets empowered by this angel, he goes, and in Mark chapter 14, verse 42, immediately after he's strengthened, rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is a hand. He's like, let's get it on. I'm ready now. I, I've, I've learned how to deal with this now. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I just needed you for one hour. You weren't there. But here's the deal. I could have said, excuse me, 
but I'm not going to go to the cross for you if you're not going to be my friend. That's not what Jesus did. That's what you would do. That's what I would do. I'd say, Father, if it beest thy will, nuketh them. But I ain't Jesus. I'm a knucklehead. And Jesus has his act together. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 18, he says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. Since Jesus has been through a place where he was tempted to freak out and bell, and he found strength, he now has it within himself that when you are tempted to freak out and bell, he has supernatural strength for you. And that is real. And here's what I'm going to tell you. Are you guys ready for this? Here we go. And I'm going to speak to the Sadducees who do not believe in supernatural power. And I'm also going to believe to the modern church that does not believe in supernatural power. Because you're both of the same tribe and you need to repent. Which, by the way, Malchus was a Sadducee. And they didn't believe in resurrection power. So when Jesus put his ear back on, there's no way that they could convict Peter because they say that stuff doesn't happen. Yeah, Jesus knows how to deal with people who, who just want to, you know, expand their 50-pound head, but they don't want to have a powerful walk. Here's what I'm going to say to you and what I'm going to say to every person that's walking all over the world is this. If Jesus Christ came across a day where he had to have supernatural strength, you will come across a day that you have to have supernatural strength. And you need to know how to find it. You need to know how to find it. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, it says, Have you not known, have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. And friends, he gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint, and they'll be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and they won't be weary. They will walk and they will not faint. You know what James 4, 6 says? It says he gives more grace. Therefore, God Almighty resists the proud. He's like, look, don't keep telling God you got this, you got this, you got this. Come before him and say, help! And he's like, all right, I will send an angel to strengthen you. And I will impart a grace and a strength unto you that's going to change your life. God Almighty gives grace to the humble. You know what grace is? It's God-given ability to overcome something. Listen, hear me say this to you. Be an overcomer. Be an overcomer. Be an overcomer. Be an overcomer. Overcome this. Overcome the, the, the unbelievable darkness of this day. Where sin does abound, friends, grace does much more abound. Wherever you're walking in something that's hard and difficult, King Jesus himself has a power for you, and he's like, you come before me and you humble yourself and you watch. If Jesus had a night like that where he had to have supernatural strength, you will have a night like that that you have to have supernatural strength. Dismiss your traditions and doctrine that says Jesus cannot personally touch you and fill you with the same resurrection power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. Hallelujah. Friends, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things. Come on. Through Christ who strengthens me. Friends, I, I, know, I know that there's a million different sermons and a lot better than this one that's being preached all over the world today. But I can just tell you this. What I get out of that is this, man. I want to tap into the power of King Jesus and say, Lord, I'm not ashamed to come to you and ask you to give me supernatural strength because I found the place where you had to have that. And then the Word of God says that if he has that, he's willing to give it out to you and I. Friends, God Almighty is not asking you to live a powerless life. He's not. He's asking you to humble yourself before him. Let's give Jesus a great big praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. So good. Friends, I have a video I want to show you, and we're going to make a very quick transition, and then we're going to do something real special. Uh, by the way, how did I do? Yeah? Hey, listen, I want to tell you guys in this room that 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 message is real. And I want, I'm telling you, Jesus is there for you. And I'm sorry for whatever hell you're going through. I, tr I truly am. 
But I'm telling you, if Jesus has been through that, and if he tapped into supernatural strength as a human being, he modeled that for you and I, and he's for you. Guys, I want y'all to watch this video. Here we go. What do you see when you look at the cross? It's so much less about shouldering a burden and so much more about laying it down. Laying down your life to follow the only one glorious enough to overcome all our tears, all our struggles, all the worries of this world, to point the way to everlasting. High on a hill, the old rugged cross stands firm as our hope of resurrection, proving that nothing can stop God from proving his love for you. Well, friends, this is my 26th Easter service to do at Open Door. <laughs> 25 years ago when we started our church in September, right? So this is my 26th Easter service. I don't think there's ever been a service that we haven't done this song. <laughs> done lots and lots of different songs throughout the years, lots of different stuff. And I always need a good excuse to go buy another 12-string guitar. Like, Leanna, I have to have that. Honey, Easter's coming. That's out of there. So, Zach, if you could put her in. If you could put her. She's asking for your help. Zach, I don't know if you can hear this lady. Yeah. Would you guys please put your ear on and be listening? Thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. So, we're about to do this. Brother Don Francisco actually wrote this song in the 1970s and uh, it's just so anointed it's the story of Peter and I can't imagine what was going through Brother Don's mind when he wrote this song but it was truly a remarkable moment for all of us it's called He's Alive down I spent the night in sleeplessness I rose at every sound half in hope the sorrow but half in fear the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away Beside me, as he told us where she'd been, she said, Someone's moved him in the night, and none of us knows where. The stone's been rolled away, and now his body isn't there. We both ran toward the garden, and John ran on ahead. We found the stone in the empty tomb. Just the way that Mary said, but the wine and sheep they wrapped him in was just an empty shell. 
And how were they taken him was more than I could tell. Something strange had happened Just what I did not know John believed a miracle I just turned to go Cause circumstance and speculation Couldn't lift me very high I'd seen them crucify him then I saw him die Back inside the house again The guilt and anguish came Everything I promised him Just added to my shame When at last it came to choices I denied I knew his name Even if he was alive, it wouldn't be the same. It wouldn't be the same. But suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume. In from everywhere and draw shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees and I just clung to him and cried. me to my feet as I looked into his eyes. Love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. And guilt in my confusion disappeared in sweet release. And every fear I'd ever known melted into peace. My friends, Jesus Christ is alive. Hey! Christ is alive and well. He is risen. He is risen. <laughs>